Joining us right now at the Canadian Science Policy Conference is Tony McBride. Tony, thanks very much for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, your title, Director of Science Policy Centre for the Royal Society. You work in London. That's right. Tell us a little bit about your organisation. Well, the Royal Society is 352 years old, founded in 1660. It's a National Academy of Science for the UK and the Commonwealth. And the bit that I work in, the bit that I lead, is the Science Policy Centre. Uh, the Science Policy Centre has existed for three years, but we've been doing science policy work since about 1664, one way or another. Oh, so how has it changed then, or why did you think that it was necessary to come up with your own department for it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've been doing policy work or public uh, and science advice more systematically, more deliberately, for about 30 years now. And over the last 10 to 20, it's become much more systematised, become much more focused and, dare I say, much more professionalised. We have a much bigger team of uh, dedicated professionals working on it. And actually, uh, the Royal Society's 350th anniversary was in 2010, and we decided, as one of a series of, of big landmark events, to create a science policy centre by bringing together two existing teams. So the science policy centre takes care of our international policy work, our domestic science policy work, and now our education policy work as well. So it brings together all of this expertise in one place. So one of the things that we hear here is that Canada doesn't have a, a national science policy. What would be some of the benefits, do you think, that if, if Canada was to implement something similar to the group that you work with? Well, it, it is true. I hear that the situation is quite different. Uh, the history, of course, is, is quite different. Um, but actually here at the Science Policy Conference, you've got a really good group of people. And uh, the session I spoke at this morning, uh, was about trying to encourage people to organise. Um, the benefits of national science policy, well, uh, it's plainly important that there is one, and of course it can take many different sizes uh, uh, and shapes. Um, the session I spoke in this morning was about science and innovation policy, and it's about embedding science advice, uh, uh, the scientific method in public policy, and about funding public science appropriately. And I think that's really important. I don't think anybody here would disagree. Um, of course, it depends on the attitude of the government of the day, um, but um, we believe at the Royal Society that good decisions are made possible with good scientific advice, and I think that's true everywhere. So, have you noticed a difference then, uh, as far as your country goes, since the formation of this group three years ago? If you say it basically consolidated efforts that have been going on for decades, has there been a difference? I think it would be... Um, uh, I it would be too big a claim to say it had a big impact in the UK. Certainly the profile of our work has increased, uh, but we're one of many actors. It's one of the big differences between the UK and, and Canada. There's a very extensive um, architecture of science advice inside and outside of government. And the Royal Society is one important piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only piece. So I wouldn't say that we'd revolutionised anything, but it's enabled us to um, coordinate more effectively, certainly enabled us to increase our international reach, and to do different kinds of work. It's helped us to fundraise, which helps us to do more work as well. So it's been, it, it's been important. I wouldn't say it's represented a step change in science advice in the UK because it's quite a well-developed field mm -hmm. already. What would you suggest Canada do at this stage? It's a very good question. Uh, I came here in 2009 to speak at the inaugural Science Policy Conference, and I got the impression then that there was a, um, a very fertile ground grassroots movement, if you like, in this community. And I think really the job is to continue to capacity build, to organise, to foster debate about science policy and the role of science in public policy, and then maybe to organise around a few specific initiatives. Um, I think there's a pretty fragmented community here, but a community of willing and interested parties. So anything that this conference and this group of people can do to bring things together, to bring people together, would be very welcome. Are you spending enough time here that you'd be able to notice a difference between, I guess, the feel or the atmosphere of the 2009 conference compared to this year's? Um, well, I certainly get soundings. I don't know whether they're accurate or whether I, my judgment is, is uh, sound. But I hear, about, uh, hear a lot about what's going on. I read a lot about what's going on. And I've had the good fortune to meet some of the same people that I was talking to four years ago. So I do have an impression that things are changing. Um, I, I, I get the impression... Um, that people are finding it tough in the science community, in budget terms, in terms of taking science advice into government. Um, that doesn't seem to have changed. 
but I, I suppose there's a little less optimism than there was even four years ago, and that's a cause for concern, I think. But it just highlights the important job that groups like those here at the, uh, at the conference have to do, the, the job that the community has to do in organising itself and getting together. Do you think, I mean, you're talking about there's been cuts to funding, obviously, because there seems to be a push on for fiscal responsibility with governments, and is this an easy thing to cut, and perhaps the people who would complain are not that vocal? or? I don't know enough about the overall budgeting system or priorities in Canada to see um, how easy a target science is. Uh, traditionally, science is a small part of the large fiscal budget, and actually in that sense, you might say there's not much to be saved. So there's an argument for not cutting science, of course, as well. But traditionally, science is seen as possibly a soft target. And uh, as we discussed this morning with the, with the delegates, uh, I think that there is an obligation on the community to organise itself, to be vocal about the importance of science and the importance of science advice. Do you think that, uh, I mean in today's society things move quite quickly it seems when it comes to innovation, technology, mm. those sorts of things. Can you survive as a country that capitalises on the inventions and innovation of other countries and import it and go with that or do you have to be one of those innovators? That's a really good question and it's something that countries all over the world are juggling with as they continue to deal with the fallout of the global recession in 2008. People are cutting back all over the place, except in China perhaps. Um, but um, I think the theory goes that you've got to have skin in the game and actually if you look at the literature you need basis, a, a good basis of R&D to be able to engage with the best in the world. So actually, science is, and innovation is increasingly collaborative, increasingly globalised, and it doesn't really seem credible that you can sit back and uh, live off other people's hard work. One of the things I've heard here a few times today is that Canada punches above its weight when it comes to research papers and, yeah. and being referenced and stuff like that. As somebody who lives in another country, when you look at Canada when it comes to science, how do you see us? Well, actually, I read the uh, Council of Canadian Academies report on the state of science and technology in, in Canada, and uh, the statistics are um, paint a mixed picture, but largely positive, and actually the information you, the, 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 the position that you refer to, punching above its weight, actually is mirrored in the UK. There's some very familiar statistics. The scales are slightly different, but the story is largely positive. So uh, I think that the rest of the world actually views Canada very positively for its research strengths, basic research strengths, uh, certainly strong in, in many fields, but as the report suggests, uh, things change pretty quickly and actually areas, interestingly, areas that were identified as basic research strengths only five or six years ago and now seem to be in decline. Um, so um, the picture is one of mixed fortunes, I think, and that's no surprise because we see that the world over. Things change very, very fast. Great. Uh, this conference, so you've been to two out of the four now, mm. uh, what are you getting out of it? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm getting the chance to reflect on the UK situation, actually. I come here and I get a chance to um, immerse myself in, in a community uh, which is going through uh, some important um, uh, uh, learning exercises, uh, learning how to orient, orient itself uh, with relation to government. And it gives me the chance to think about what we're doing in the UK. Of course, I get invited to talk about the UK experience. And it gives me a chance to reflect on what we might do at the Science Policy Centre, how we could work differently, how we could work with partners. So all around it's a chance to step right back and think about what we're doing back in the UK. Thank you very much, Tony. It's been Thank a pleasure. We've been chatting with Tony McBride, who is the Director of Science Policy Centre at the Royal Society in the UK.